A waterhole in Africa is like Piccadilly Circus in London or Times Square in New York. Sooner or later, everyone shows up there. Some come to eat. Most come to drink. A few come to hunt. This is the story of the visitors, the residents, and the dramas that affect their lives at a waterhole in Etosha National Park, Namibia. just after the rains. This water hole in Etosha is different from those in many parts of Africa. It's spring fed, and unlike most others, never dries up. You'd expect that animals would come thronging to it once the rains have topped it up, but no, it's deserted, except for the resident birds like the dabchick and red-billed teal. After a few weeks of hot sun has dried up all the rainwater puddles out in the bush, the animals start to trickle back. A few at first, and then in gradually increasing numbers. The year-round story of this water hole starts just after the rains. The return of the herds is bad news for two of the resident birds. A pair of blacksmith plovers has decided to nest right at the water's edge. Plovers are courageous birds. They stand their ground against all comers, spreading their wings and cursing in defense of their nest. The surviving yellow flowers will eventually all be eaten. The big animals aren't particularly fond of them. They're a weed that flourishes where all the grass has been eaten around the water hole. The springbok try to avoid them, not always successfully. Now the plovers have eggs to protect from all those trampling hooves. Three large warthogs arrive to drink and wallow and add to the plover's problems.
there's always something happening. The rains have triggered off the hatching of millions of small brown flies, providing a feast for water birds, especially the waders. The green shank has to pick off each fly separately and delicately. The fulvous tree duck and the cape teal scoop them up wholesale with their bills. The plague of flies has come at just the right time for the red-billed teal and her hungry brood of ducklings. There always seems to be one in every brood that doesn't appreciate the danger of ignoring the convoy system. The threat this time comes from a lana falcon. Missed both times. The little teal survives by diving and rejoins the brood. The lana's next attack is on the whole convoy. This time the teal get away with it. The blacksmith plovers are still having serious problems. There's only one treatment for nosy zebra. In the end, it isn't the zebra's hooves that prove the plover's undoing. Tawny eagles are predators, but they will eat carrion, and eggs are always welcome. The eagle broke all three eggs, but didn't eat any of them. It was probably hoping to find a fully formed chick inside. The plover's spirited diving attacks are all in vain. It will probably lay again in a safer place. The parents recover the cracked eggs and carry them about 10 metres away. They pull the embryos out of the shells and then give the whole situation up as hopeless. The springbok have their young in the time of good grazing after the first rains. The young are just the sort of easy meat a lion is always looking for.
there is one young animal lions usually leave alone. Just the same, elephants would be much happier if the lions weren't there when they bring their young to drink. And they make their feelings plain. During and just after the rains, the elephants of Itosha do a disappearing trick. They simply vanish into the woodland to the northeast. They leave the waterhole largely to avoid the soft soil where they could easily get bogged down. A month after the rains have stopped, when the country is dry enough, they're suddenly back in great strength. There's nothing an elephant loves so much as water. After the bath, a dust down. This is the Etosha equivalent of talcum powder. Because of the color of the soil, pink elephants are quite common here. These yellow flowers grow on a low, scrubby species of acacia that is spreading in Itosha. The giraffe have no complaints about that. Where acacia and Ibrownii grows close to the waterhole, they've got everything they need, at least for a day or so.
The tongue manipulates the thorns to strip the flowers. When a giraffe takes a drink, it looks as though it must suffer a sudden rush of blood to the head. But a network of spongy tissues and valves between neck and brain absorb the blood and slow up the downward flow. The combined attractions of acacias and a drink sometimes draw herds of 30 or 40 giraffe to the waterhole. But such a gathering rarely results in outbreaks of high spirits like this. As with a herd of horses, it all seems to be triggered off by one skittish animal. Those long muscular legs, so innocent in play, can kill a lion with a single kick. Even though giraffes at a waterhole look easy prey, lions usually leave the adults alone. But this giraffe is an exception. It has a bad shoulder wound from a previous lion attack. Perhaps the wound encouraged this lion. Both parties seem to recognize that it's not going to come to anything. The lions lie down, and the giraffe slowly, without any sign of alarm, approaches the water once more. Dusk is not far away and the giraffe wisely decides that in the half-light it would be dangerous to linger. Sunset is the time when the prey animals leave the waterhole and seek the comparative safety of the open plains. As the moon comes up, only those big enough to have nothing to fear are left. What happens at the waterhole in darkness often remains unseen. But an image intensifier can reveal what the bland, cold eye of the moon looks down upon.
Itosha is one of the black rhino's last strongholds. Though daylight observations may reveal little, at night they come to drink and indulge in the heavyweight tussles so dear to a rhino's armor-protected heart. The elephant herd ignores the rhino goings-on and takes pride of place at the water. Some double-banded sand grouse have taken advantage of the full moon to do some night flying and drinking. A rhino with a large calf has a dispute with another cow. When a smaller herd of elephant arrives, it finds itself in the middle of a pride of lions that can't be ignored. The lions back down, even though there are more of them. It's probably sheer devilment on the part of the elephants, though they do have calves with them that need protecting. There's no real development from this confrontation. The true drama will start again when the sun comes up. There is action at the water hole as soon as the sun rises. The black-headed heron waits for prey. Zebra pluck up courage to come in from the plains. The black-headed heron is extremely unpopular at the water hole. The blacksmith plovers give it a routine, low-level attack, though they are not its prey. The heron's speciality is doves. It spends all day stalking Cape turtle doves. Having caught them, it dunks them in the water to damp their feathers before swallowing. the heron has its own problems. The resident tawny eagle steals a percentage of the catch. There are plenty more where that one came from and the heron never gives up. Thank <laughs> you. 
This time it's taking no chances and flies off with its prey, pursued by the eagle. The doves who come to drink at the waterhole face submarine attack as well. A lucky escape. But the capture of the next victim has an almost prehistoric horror about it. The terrapins, finding themselves too far from the water to feel safe, scuttle back to try somewhere else. Like most cats, lions are naturally curious. They're also nervous of unfamiliar situations. Here the terrapins have trapped an egret by the leg. The black-headed heron is hoping to gain from the egret's plight. The heron retreats. At least one terrapin has got a firm grip on the egret's foot. The lions are cautious.
By the time a cub goes to investigate, the egret is free. Free, but decidedly lame. Few predators get the better of a terrapin, but occasionally it happens. The fish eagle's curved talons and hooked beak can find the chinks in the armor. The armor of the tortoise has to be impregnable. Though it can swim, it lives practically all its life on land. There it's exposed to all manner of dangers, from lions that would eat it to elephants that might accidentally step on it. If the waterhole provides moments of comedy, its scenario also includes scenes of beauty. The blue cranes are coming to drink among a small party of kudu. The sight of a lion nearby, hidden in the yellow grass, sets off a duet of calling and dancing. As the dry season progresses, at least 200 bird species come to the waterhole. The great white pelican to fish. But most, like the ostriches, only to drink and perhaps quarrel, like these three females over a solitary male. A battler eagle with two young. The Cory Bustard is made unwelcome by a crow. The mixed drinkers include bulbuls, glossy starlings, red-headed finches, 
and weavers. A wax bill, grey turaco and a Maya's parrot. The same beach is also open for mixed bathing. Hosts of small birds, as well as giants like the four-foot-high Cory Bustard. Or the crowned guinea fowl, who often arrive in huge coveys. Vast swarms of red-billed quelia, whose combined weight sometimes breaks the branches from the trees. August is the height of the dry season. The rains aren't due till October. Now the animals are completely dependent on Etosha's water holes for their survival. These are spring-fed and never dry up. A large family of banded mongooses comes to drink. The parents are cautious. They have young with them. These are the Makwa sand grass. Despite his size, the wallowing warthog doesn't worry the mongooses. But the jackal makes everyone slightly apprehensive. These guinea fowl have been waiting to get to the water for some time. They've been scared of crossing a large open space. The coveys have gradually built up until there are hundreds of birds waiting to cross. Finally, when numbers give them courage, it's as if a dam breaks. Some get their drink. but the jackal alarms them just as it alarmed the mongooses. A far stealthier and deadlier hunter lurks beneath the surface of the water. A python snorkels, its nostrils hidden among the waterweed. Oh. 
an Egyptian goose spots the danger. For a red-billed teal, it's already too late. While the rest of its three-metre-long body puts on the lethal pressure, the python's head comes up for air. A snake like this can stay totally submerged for an hour or more. The final act of the drama, the python swallows the duck. Flamingos aren't usually found feeding at small water holes. But when the 70 mile long Itosha pan dries up, they have nowhere else to go. They're normally found only on large soda lakes or at the coast, so flamingos are rarely seen in company with drinking zebra, kudu and wildebeest. It is even rarer to find them in such a cramped and unlikely setting, forming up into display parties. This strutting march is a prelude to courtship. They're mostly lesser flamingos, with some graters among them. Avocets sweep their bills in the foreground, looking for the same sort of crustacea that the flamingos are having to make do with under drought conditions. One reason why flamingos choose large remote lakes on which to feed and breed is that they feel safe there from land predators. Here, there is no such guarantee. When the rains come, the Atosha pan will flood and the flamingos will return there. If the rains are late, they may perhaps have to move hundreds of miles to the salt pans along the coast. The height of the dry season is an easy time for hunters. Antelope like these kudu have to congregate at the waterhole. Adult kudu are usually safe from cheetah. They're too big, 
She's after smaller game, Springbok. This time she loses her quarry in the dust. She's got a large family to feed, so she'll stay around the waterhole until she's successful. She disregards the adult springbok to her left and picks a younger victim. She drags back the kill and calls to the cubs. She lets her family feed before she eats herself. Finally, she cleans them up. Later, she'll lead them down to the waterhole for a drink. For the cheetah family, too, it provides all the necessities of life. But the waterhole will soon cease to be vital for survival. It's October and the rains are imminent. The springboks see the coming storms and start to move away from the permanent water. There's food and drink out there where the rain is falling. The rhino won't need this spring-fed puddle much longer either. Springbok pronk joyfully, as if at their release from the confinement and ever-present danger of the waterhole. As to the waterfowl, they'll move around a bit, but the permanent residents, the teal and the Egyptian geese, will stay on throughout the rains that will continue from October to March. And at the end of the deluge, the grass will be green again. The water hole will still be there. It'll be a little fuller and a lot fresher, and there won't be an animal in sight. There'll be carpets of yellow flowers, but nothing to eat them. It's hard to imagine that all those dramas ever took place here. Let the sun do its work for a few weeks, and they'll all be back. For all the waterhole's dangers, the animals of Itosha would perish if they stayed away from it for too long.
Next week, the tragic story of the elephants of Tsavo National Park who are facing extinction from poachers. That's Kingdom of the Plains next Monday at 5 o'clock. Dinosaurs, killing machines. For 160 million years, they were masters of the planet. And then, in a flash of geological time, they died out. Vanished, forgotten, a buried menagerie of skeleton beasts lying in wait just below the skin of the earth. This is the story of how dinosaurs came back to life, of the men and women who have devoted themselves to reviving them, and of the greatest mystery of all, why have all the dinosaurs vanished? The first of this four-part series studies the most successful land animals ever and explains the dinosaur craze in 19th century North America. Dinosaur Footprint starts this Thursday at 8 on Channel 4.